Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. Just want to say a quick word of welcome uh, and thank you. Um, you have already showed your hospitality and faithfulness to my family. All of the cards and letters and emails uh, have been well received uh, and overwhelming. So thank you. We couldn't be more excited to start again here as a part of this church family. So we are very excited um, and I am humbled and honored to be your pastor. Thank you. Good morning, First Columbus Saints. I know this is not exactly the face that you may want to see in the pulpit today. And there is a marvelous method to our madness as your presbytery gives thanks to God for the leadership of Joel Alvis and welcomes with delight the leadership of Danny Deeth. So as we prepare as God's people today to hear these very little known verses from Judges, it's worth noting that this passage is one of the oldest recorded songs in Scripture. It portrays yet another messy moment in the life of Israel. The Israelites had been suffering mightily under the cruel leadership of a Canaanite king, until a judge named Devorah came upon the scene and urged the Israelite army into action. Long story short, the Israelites are successful in battle. The Canaanite general, Sisera, flees the field and then hides in a neighboring town. The cowardly general, we learn, is greeted by an unflappable woman by the name of Jael, whose kin were particularly sympathetic to the Israelite cause. As a result, she offers food and shelter to lure the general to sleep. His reward? A tent peg through the skull. The Canaanite army is brought to their knees, and the Israelites garner a glorious success. But this is not a story of unmitigated and easy success. Rather, it's a story of success shaded and shaped by sorrow. So listen to this as we hear Judges 5, verses 24 through 28 and verse 31. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. The general asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a lordly bowl. She put her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck General Sisera a blow. She crushed his head, she shattered and pierced his temple. He sank, he fell. He lay still at her feet, at her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. In another place, out of the window, the mother of Sisera peered. She gazed through the lattice. She exclaimed, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? So perish all your enemies, O Lord, but may your friends be like the sun as it rises in its might. This is hardly a bedtime story for children, right? 
And yet it's a crucial story because it reminds us that courage often rises in the most surprising of places. It also reminds us that when we create tempestuous battle lines, instead of trust-laden bridges, everyone loses. So, beloved saints of First Presbyterian, it is a delight to be here today to remind us of our partnership between all of you and 43 sister churches who love you, who pray for you, and who remember you and are rejoicing with you on this day. May we celebrate this partnership between congregation and presbytery, and may we intentionally commit to building more bridges. As we dive into our second lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, it's helpful to remember that this story takes place at the very beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. This journey would take three years to complete and cover over 2,000 miles. In this particular moment, we enter the story to find Paul and his companion Silas both in Philippi, in the midst of an unexpected brawl, after having removed a demon from a locally owned slave girl. Listen to these words from Act, chap, Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 36. But when the slave girl's owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, the owner said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and they are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into the prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, the jailer put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were unopened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. The word of the Lord. A few years ago, I was asked to preach at a colleague's installation in Maryland. So I headed up the interstate, blissfully following Google Maps until about three hours out, I realized that I would need to cross the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. I am particularly petrified of high bridges over deep waters. I contemplated a lot of alternatives, none feasible, so I gripped the wheel a little tighter and attempted to breathe. Mile after agonizing mile, I crept all rational thought suffocated by a blanket of fear. Until, until somewhere beyond or within, I heard a calm, many-layered voice say, just sing, sweet pea, sing, seriously. For whatever reason, I didn't question the presence of the voice at the moment, nor did I question my own sanity, which would have been wise. Instead, I listened, not always my strong suit, and I sang. 
The only song I could remember at that moment was Farah Jaka, and every note trembled, but I sang anyway. And as I continued to sing, a very tiny bubble of laughter started to form right next to my very vast ocean of fear. The laughter loosened something within me, and I began to remember a little more than Farah Jaka. I began to sing, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Slowly, slowly, I could feel the wave of fear recede. And a solid shore of gratitude remained. Now let me be clear. I am still undone whenever I come to a long, high bridge over very deep waters, but I have a gift that comes with me now. It's a memory of that calm, many-layered voice and the unmistakable power of song. In other words, I'm still scared and I keep moving. Terror is often a doorway to God's tenderness. And memories often provide the thread of courage we need. And then there's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who counters our terror time and time again by throwing us a thread so we may be sewn into places we would not willingly choose to go, but places we must if we are going to move from playing church to being church. We all know about those spaces we can't avoid, whether it's a pivotal conversation at a session meeting, a heart-to-heart -heart with a fellow church member with whom we disagree, a quiet visit to a bedside as breathing slows or a determined contact with the bedraggled woman whose eyes we usually ignore when walking downtown. We know that in those spaces we are being stitched into the way of Jesus and that the Spirit's thread of courage becomes a lifeline. It tugs us free from the chains of fear until we can move until we can dance through the darkness and land in the light. I believe this is exactly what Paul and Silas teach us, how to move around in the world, how to make intentional space for the love of God and the love of neighbor in our crowded, crowded lives. They show us how to borrow a phrase, how to whistle in the dark, so that when the prisons of our own making loom large at every turn, Paul and Silas, prisoners of someone else's making, they remind us to sing. They don't provide us with a neat checklist of qualities required for a successful sing-along, nor do they offer a how-to list for the uncertain beginner. They simply start because it's obvious to them that there's no other choice. Yes, of course, they could have chosen to rage against the powers that be. Of course, they could have crafted a detailed plan of revenge for when they were free. Of course, they could have assured themselves that the bottom of a state prison wasn't all that bad. Surely there were worse places to be. Of course, they could have chosen to sleep through it all hoping that it would surely be better in the morning. 
But they don't. They don't. Instead, they choose to remain in the midst of pain and uncertainty and sorrow and to pray and to praise and to sing. They choose to be witnesses to a power greater than their own. And because of their courage, Scripture tells us the prisoners were listening. People noticed. People still do. People pay attention to what we do as disciples. There's a little known story about the events leading up to the fall of the Berlin Wall. For months, the citizens of Leipzig would gather by candlelight every Monday evening at St. Nikolai's Church, where Bach wrote so many of his compositions. And they would gather and they would sing. Within months, a few thousand people had grown into 300,000 people, and they sang about peace and hope and justice. Protesters lifted, protesters lifted their voices, not their fists, and their songs shook the powers of their nation and literally changed the world. Sometime after the fall occurred, a journalist asked one of the commanders of the East German secret police why they hadn't crushed the protest of St. Nikolai since they had clearly crushed so many others. The officer replied, we had no contingency plan for song. In other words, they had no earthly idea what to do. They who had been schooled for ordinary ugliness were confronted with extraordinary beauty. They who expected battle experienced blessing. They who were geared up for a fight were graced with a fugue. Those who expected the mess of protest discovered the melody of persistence. The prisoners we're listening, indeed, and they are just as often within us as they are around us. When we listen, we remember, and memory shaped by God's providence brings transformation. The truth bears repeating, because the monsters that greet us in the dark are often the ones of our own making, sidling up in silence, keeping us chained and whispering all manner of outrage. And yet when we hear only terror, God tenderly teaches. When we see only a cross sagging under violence and death, God shows us that resurrection is right around the corner, that courage is warranted, and darkness defied. So while the rest of the world may not have a contingency plan for song, may not know exactly what to do with hope-filled harmonies, rumor has it that we as disciples of Jesus Christ actually do know what to do. We are God's melody makers after all, each and every one of us, whether we can carry a tune or not, all of us, all of us, each and every one of us, are gifted with holy and tremendous capacities for courage and compassion, forgiveness and generosity. All of us are called to unfasten the chains which keep our hearts still, that we might be vigorous and enthusiastic witnesses to Jesus Christ from Georgia to Guatemala and beyond to all the world, as we'll celebrate with our mission conference this week here. So now is as good a time as any to live this out. And chances are, when we follow that thread, 
There will be angels to greet us at every turn. And they'll be saying to us what they always say, do not be afraid. Beloved of God, may we sing ourselves out of every captive fear that haunts us. May we sing our way to the kingdom. May we sing our way home. Let us pray together. God of grace and glory, wisdom and power, remind us that you have given us everything we need to be your disciples in this time and space. Show us how to face each day with clear-eyed conviction and deep-rooted hope. Show us how to be, that we might not dismiss the evil of the world, nor be undone by it, but rather defy it with unfathomable gentleness and persistent trust. Show us the way of the cross, and then send us your Holy Spirit to sing with us along the way. Send us your Spirit, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.